This episode of Cheat Codes, a sickle cell podcast, is intended for informational and entertainment purposes only. This episode of Cheat Codes was supported by Adacvio. Dr. Mike, we're off to another episode of Cheat Codes. How are you today? I'm excited. Me too, me too. We have uh, two alumni of Cheat Codes, two uh, just exceptional sickle cell colleagues of ours who have been on Cheat Codes before, who are pushing forward. They're pushing the ball down the field, man. For sure. We're going to get deep into some science today. I love it. I love it. But you know what? The listeners aren't here to hear us. They're not here to hear us speak. They want to hear our guests speak. So we're going to give them all the time possible. And what I'm going to do actually is ask our esteemed guests after I welcome them to talk a little bit about themselves. Are you good with that, Dr. Callahan? That sounds perfect. Let's do it. Well, let's start with Dr. Vijay Shankaran. Dr. Vijay Shankaran, welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Why don't you remind the Cheat Codes listeners a little bit about who you are and why sickle cell disease matters to you? Absolutely. Um, So uh, I am on the faculty here at Boston Children's Hospital. I practice as a pediatric hematologist. And our research over the last 18 or so years has really focused on ways that we can better understand sickle cell disease and develop ways that we can treat the, this disease. And in fact, things that we've done now 15, 16 years ago are now starting to lead to, to ongoing therapies. And, and um, so we're very excited, but obviously there's a lot that we need to do and a lot we still need to learn. And so it's, it's terrific to be here. And you're joined by a colleague who, of course, is no stranger to you. We have Dr. Mitch Weiss. Welcome, Dr. Mitch Weiss. It's a pleasure to have you on Cheat Codes once again. Thank you. I'm so happy that you invited me back. I love listening to your show. It's an absolute pleasure. Why don't you remind us a little bit as well to remind the Cheat Codes listeners who Dr. Mitch Weiss is and why he's interested in sickle cell disease. So I'm a physician scientist. I work in the laboratory and I, and I take care of patients. And a lot of the patients that I take care of are children with sickle cell disease. V- VJ and I are, are like Um, roots from the same tree or sprouts from the same tree, I should say. We both trained at Boston Children's Hospital. And um, I left there maybe 20, 25 years ago. And I went to the University of Pennsylvania where I worked in the lab and took care of sickle cell patients. And then seven years ago, I moved to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And one of the reasons I did that is because um, before I moved, I was working in the lab and, and I was taking care of sickle cell patients but I was not working in the lab for sickle cell patients. And w- w- when I moved to St. Jude, I changed my work around a little bit. I, I, I modified the research that I was doing and began to, to study ways to cure sickle cell disease because every pediatric hematologist who takes care of sickle cell patients gets very frustrated um, when, they, when, when they see that um, w- what the problems are with sickle cell disease and they say, boy, I would really like to cure this. And so I had the opportunity to go after that by moving to St. Jude. Now, I should also say um, the the tree is small, but there are a lot of sprouts. And I have another sprout behind me who is Supriya, who is a a young hematology oncology fellow, a trainee, who also came to us from Boston Children's Hospital. So in in our profession, it's a small world. And, you know, we want to get Supriya interested in in helping sickle cell disease patients also. I just want to say, you know, our guests do have a lot in common, including that they're both very humble. Um, These are (laughs) really two of the leading scientists in sickle cell, in hematology, in genetics, in the world. I mean, we're really honored to have you both here today. But one thing that's always impressed me about scientists is you're really in tight competition. You're competing for grants. But you collaborate, so your labs are probably competing day to day for discoveries, competing for grants. But I see you guys publish papers together. So can you tell me a little bit about how how you wind up collaborating with you know what could be your enemies? The term we use is frenemy. <laughs> well, but you know I don't necessarily view it so much as a competition. Uh, you know I I mean Mitch has been a close friend and mentor for many many years. You know Mitch was on my um, my committee. We have an advisory committee when we were um, students, and when I was an MD-PhD student, and I started to work on fetal hemoglobin regulation, this was 
16, 17 years ago. Um, at the time, no one was working on it. And everybody said, don't do this. Um, but but Mitch you know, was on my committee and was there to advise me and has been a close friend since then. Um, and you know, the way I look at it is there is a lot of things that might overlap with other investigators. But I think at the end of the day, one single set of discoveries is not going to shape a field. It's really a whole group of discoveries. And so I think one of the most satisfying things that I find in our field is when you make a discovery and somebody else can replicate that or somebody takes that discovery and extends it and, and you know, pulls off the next you know, layer of that, you know, I like to think of, you know, science in some ways like an onion, you know, you peel off one layer and then you get to the next layer and there's still more to learn. And I think in many ways, that's not just true with science, it's true with clinical medicine too. You know, as we learn more and as we'll discuss today, I believe, um, you know, as you kind of get one set of therapies well, it turns out there might be some limitations to those therapies. And maybe we need to peel off the onion layer and really learn more about the next layer and what's beneath it. And think a lot about how we might improve upon the therapies that, that do exist. I love that analogy. And, and, and to further that analogy of peeling the onion back, I mean, along the way, while you're peeling that onion, you're going to have some tears. It's not the easiest process, right? You know, speaking of that, let, let's talk about the process. You know, the process really that we're dancing around here is, is gene therapy as a cure for sickle cell disease. So, so why don't you guys walk us through, walk the sickle cell patients who may be listening to this through the process, just, just at a high level of how gene therapy looks. As most people listening to this podcast probably know, sickle cell disease is caused by a mutation in one gene. That gene is called beta globin or HBV. And, and the, the way we do gene therapy for sickle cell disease currently is that we, we remove the blood forming cells from the patient's body. Usually now we do that by apheresis, which is a machine that you hook up to the patient and it, it, can, it can take the blood forming cells um, uh, um, out of the patient and, and purify them. And then we, we take those blood forming cells, they're called hematopoietic stem cells, and, and we modify them somehow to either correct that gene mutation or sneak our way around the bad effects. You know, do, do, we do something to those cells to overcome the bad effects of that mutation. And then we put those cells back into the patient's body. Those cells are called hematopoietic stem cells. And, and, and what they're supposed to do when, when, this, when this process works correctly is to, to, to go back in the patient, find their way back into the bone marrow, and then um, produce red blood cells that have been rescued from the bad effects of sickle cell disease. And, and, and I will tell you that doing the, there's a lot of steps to this, and it requires a lot of skill and expertise, multidisciplinary expertise, which means that you have to work with different kinds of experts. And it's almost like, it's like if you go to a fancy restaurant, you know, a French restaurant, say, and you buy a, a $500 dinner, it's not just the food, right? It's the way the food is served. And, and it's, it's everything leading up to the preparation and the serving of the food. And that's how gene therapy is also. It needs to be done in an experienced place with a lot of attention to many details in order for it to go right. To be completely honest, we're just learning about those details. So that's why it's research. And what we're starting to learn is that some of the details for sickle cell patients may be unique. There may be unique issues that, 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 that specifically pertain to, to, to sickle cell patients that we need to know about better in order to, in order to do this in the best way possible. And what are some of those specific issues, I guess? Yeah, well, I think that there's a number of, of, of um, you know, limitations, but hopefully things that will continue to make progress. And so these blood forming stem cells that Mitch was referring to, you know, we can, to some extent, enumerate them, but we're not so good at working with them. And it turns out we can't necessarily know how many stem cells any one individual has. We just, by luck, get whatever cells we can, we either add in the DNA that corrects the sickle cell mutation, or we try to add in um, tools, 
genome editing tools or other tools that allow us to modify the genome in, in those stem cells. But there are lots of other cells. And so I think one major limitation we have is oftentimes we can't necessarily control the amount of cells any one individual has or we get from any one individual, nor can we control what are the outcomes of the correction. There might be some uncorrected cells at the same time that there's some corrected cells or um, some cells that are modified. And so you get this mixture. And, and that's one limitation that we face. The other limitation that's really come to, to light recently, which I think to some extent is causing you know concern in the field, and I, and I think it's hard to know what exactly underlies this, is the fact that in a couple of instances, patients have been given blood-forming stem cells, you know, that are corrected in some way, and after some period of time, those patients have gone on to get blood cancers. And when people have examined where those blood cancers arose from, it turns out that they have actually arisen from the patient's own blood forming stem cells that have somehow acquired mutations that make them likely to form that blood cancer. Now there's a lot we don't understand at the moment, but I think that that's been um, resulting in, in halts in, in several ongoing trials that I'm familiar with. And so I think that that's been one limitation that's, that's the field is facing at the moment. That's the biggest fear. And I, I think that brings up, you know, both sides of something. There's this huge potential for benefit. There's a lot of innovative things going on, but there's also potential risk. So how do we balance that? And how do we make sure that, you know, we're, we're being fair to the participants in the trial, that we're doing this in the safest way possible, but answering the questions we need to, to eventually find cures and get that out to people? Well, the only way is to do clinical research, to have clinical trials, to test to, to, to test the therapies using this under this most under conditions that are as safe as possible that that offer a potential benefit for the patients. And I, I have to say, um, Amar and Mike, I listened to your episode on Tuskegee with Jeremy Estep, and you know that story is bone chilling. And you know the, the the fact that that medical researchers could 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 abuse black people in that kind of way for, for to, to advance medical knowledge. And um, I, I, I want to tell your patients, our patients, I don't think it's like that anymore for medical research. The, there, there, are, the, 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 there are committees, IRBs or internal review committees, whose only job it is, is to make sure that the patient is protected and, and that we don't do anything that that would unnecessarily harm the patients, or um, or that doesn't offer them some potential of having a benefit from the treatment. This is a heavily regulated issue now, and um, and I feel confident that most people have have the patient's interests in heart now. And you know, and we all remember Tuskegee. Everybody who's working on this. So I feel that that it's ethically. It, that the ethics are, are, are pretty good, as good as they could be. Having said that, there is a risk to any kind of medical studies, any kind of clinical trials where we don't know the answer, there's a risk. And in that way, I, you, you call your patients warriors, right? I would say that the people who engage in these kind of clinical trials are the most elite warriors that there are. They, they are the, the special forces of warriors because they're putting themselves on the line with the chance that, that, that they could get better, but also with the chance that they might not. And they're doing it partly for the benefit of themselves, but they're do, also doing it for the benefit of other people. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I know when I enrolled patients in studies in clinic, often that's what they say. Well, I hope we can learn something that'll help the kids or um, that can make things better for other people. Yeah. To add to what Mitch was saying, though, I do think that it also compels us as scientists and physicians to learn more. I mean, I think that there's a lot of issues facing our sickle cell warriors that we just don't know. I'll give you one example. So forgetting even about gene therapy or gene, gene editing trials that are ongoing, patients with sickle cell disease have been reported to have a higher rate of some kinds of blood cancers. And at the same time, 
it's important to bear in mind that this has only been reported in a few studies. Now, part of the issue was for many, many years, for decades, patients with sickle cell disease were not living often into adulthood. It was, it was it, you know, there was a lot of uh, limitations because of the risk of infectious disease and other complications that we were not good at managing. And, and thanks to advances in, in medical sciences, we have gotten better at managing many of those complications. But at the same time, I think what, what these issues that have been faced in the gene therapy field have really revealed is the need to learn more about what's happening even at baseline in our patients with sickle cell disease. And I think that that's so important uh, and, and, and so understudied. And, you know, it's interesting, for instance, you know, in, in one of the major journals in our field, Blood, there's been a lot of commentaries people have written about, you know, what's the risks and what, what could be happening. But there's not that much data. And I think that that's actually one major issue is I tend to be very data driven and I tend to say, okay, what is there that can allow me to make a decision one way or the other? And the fact that we don't have the data to says, I think, a lot, you know, and, and says really we need to do better at, at learning more about this. And I would say even as we move into thinking about gene therapy or genome editing approaches, there's much more that we need to learn, perhaps even in the laboratory before we go into clinical trials that should inform what we should look for. I mean, a great example is work that Mitch had done where it turns out that there are these tools, you know, that, that received the Nobel Prize for the discovery of these tools called CRISPR-Cas9. And I know you guys have discussed this on, on Cheat Codes in the past, but basically they're molecular scissors. And Jennifer Doudna and, and, and Emmanuel Charpentier discovered it. They got the Nobel Prize for, for their discoveries. Now, one of the issues Mitch has uncovered is if you introduce these tools into blood-forming stem cells and you form a break anywhere in the genome, that break could actually cause translocations and changes, large changes that might not be detected using routine methods. And so I think it really tells us that even if the tools exist, we need to approach this, uh, the, these efforts very cautiously and, and, and try to learn more as we do this. Now, in defense of, of using that approach, there are several clinical trials going on that, that introduce that break, and including a publication in January showing that two patients who are treated that way are, are, are doing well. And so um, when, when we published the results of that study, we said, well, we, we are not sure what this means clinically. And I would imagine that you would have the people who are doing the clinical trials saying, we haven't seen anything yet, or we haven't seen anything. But I think having the knowledge is the important part and, and, and keeping it in mind so that at least you know where to look for it. But we don't know what that laboratory finding means in terms of patients. Um, and that's the, you know, that's the part that would require a clinical trial in order to know. But we have, knowing that, we've, we've made some modifications to our planned gene therapy technique to minimize that. So, but, but it's but it's never one big leap from you don't know to you know it's it's many steps and i'll give you another example since vj cited my work i'll cite his there are um there is a notion that um everybody develops these mutations in their blood forming cells as they get older called clonal hematopoiesis and they become especially common after the age of 50 or 60. And there is some, some suspicion that patients with sickle cell disease might develop those mutations at a faster rate throughout life because their, their, their bone marrow is affected by the sickle cell disease. People have started looking at that and there are two papers that, that, that have been written. One by Vijay's group, which, which says, we don't see that. And one by another group, which says, we see that. We see an accelerated rate of clonal hematopoiesis in patients with sickle cell disease. And if you read those papers, what you'll, what you'll find is that both groups acknowledge each other's findings and they say, well, the methods that we use weren't perfect because the, the right ex we, nobody's done a controlled correct experiment yet on this. We use this, we came to this conclusion using data that was pre-existing 
and we have to respect the other side's opinion and um, this is going to require further research. And so that, you know, that's exactly what VJ says. Now, now somebody has to make a bigger experiment that addresses this in a more decisive way. And this is how we learn step by step. Yeah. And, and, and I would just add to that. I mean, I think that our findings and, and the, what was reported in this smaller study by this other group that it really just looked at a smaller group of, of patients and compared them to external controls that because they didn't really have internal controls that were in se- that were sequenced together is they said, well, maybe we detect a little bit of a higher rate. But actually, if you look at the paper now, you know, it, it basically says, well, we couldn't really statistically see much of an increase. There might be a slight signal. Um, you know, they were just limited by numbers. You know, they were talking, you know, you could count the number of patients with this clonal hematopoiesis, you know, on, on one hand or two hands that they were looking at. And so, so, you know, th- there was a limited number of patients. We looked at a slightly larger group of patients, uh, about 3,000 patients with sickle cell disease, and they're using whole genome sequencing. So looking at the entirety, all 6 billion bases of, of your DNA in every cell, um, we did not see a higher rate of sickle cell disease. And, and all of the patients with sickle cell disease were sequenced with individuals without sickle cell disease. So it was done in a little bit more of a controlled manner from a technical perspective. But the one issue that still remains is, you know, we could only detect cells that, you know, make up one in 10 of your blood forming stem cells. So it turns out if you have a mutation that's less frequent than about 10% or so of, of the cells that make up your blood forming stem cells, we might miss that mutation. And it actually, in the work that was done, um, you know, in the cases where patients went on to develop these blood cancers in the clinical trials, it turned out they could look at the, the cells that they obtained from this process that Mitch had described where they were getting the blood forming stem cells through what was called phoresis. And when they looked at that, uh, those cells, they could detect a very low level of these mutations. And other people have seen this in, in other clinical trials, such as transplants from other donors. People have seen Courtney Fitzhugh at the NIH, for example, has seen very small clones that existed before. And then as the trial went on, those clones suddenly took over. And so I think that there's lots to learn, but I think probably the most important thing is not necessarily looking at more patients, but really looking more deeply might help us. Now, on the flip side of that, the one thing I will say is what we know from studies of adult blood cancers where people study this process is normally those very small clones don't give you that much prognostic information. So very large clones, if you're above 60 years of age or so, and you have a clone above that 10% that I told you about, you have a high risk of getting a blood cancer, about tenfold compared to the general population. If you have a small clone, that risk is not the same when people have looked at it. And there's been a couple of um, really large studies that have done that, where they've actually looked at everybody in large populations, such as the Women's Health Initiative and some of the other population cohorts where they've followed people over decades. So I think that there's a lot of questions, but I think it's actually just as important that we don't get comfortable and that we start to, you know, really push ourselves to get better and ask these questions. I think that when when we as physicians and scientists are uncomfortable, usually that's when progress is made. And I think that this should be a time where we should give ourselves a kick in the shin, so to speak, and, and really say, you know, Mitch, is that trial really the right thing to do? And, or should we, re, should we think about it? Should we be looking for other things? Should we be um, pushing ourselves harder to better look at endpoints? And I think that that's one of the values of, of being in this field is that we should push ourselves and we can push ourselves. And, and, and we want to do, I think, ultimately, what's really best for our warriors and, and, and really try to learn more. Yeah, I, I can tell you, The information that we just discussed, nobody knows what to do with it clinically. Nobody knows, you know, I've I've been on several phone calls and people say, well, should we test patients for this before they undergo gene therapy? And, you know, always there's an argument as to whether that's going to help or not. 
And I, you know, I think it will, it will take some time to get those answers. There is always something that we don't know. If you look at the field of gene therapy over the last 20 years, it's been success, failure, success, failure. And so it's always two, two steps forward, one step backward. And, um, and we're in a much better place than, than we were 20 years ago, but, but there's, still, um, there's still setbacks. And one of the things that concerns me is our, our system now doesn't tolerate setbacks very well. So, you know, the, 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 big co- the big gene therapy company, Bluebird, has learned a tremendous amount about gene therapy. You know, they, they probably know as much as anybody else in the world about how to do this. These two or three cancers that happened in their sickle cell gene therapy patient out, out of something like 50 patients was a huge setback for them. And in the world of finance, that can put you out of business. And it, it would it, it would just be a shame to put a group of people out of business who know who know more about this than than most mostly anybody else. But the structure of our system might favor that. There are academia people who who study gene therapy, but it's much harder thing to do in academics because it costs so much money. So you know we could do better all working together to figure this out. We, you know we try but the system holds us back sometimes. Today's episode of Cheat Codes is brought to you by Novartis, manufacturers of Adacvio and the Adacvio Warrior Way program. Hey, warriors fighting sickle cell disease, you know how unpredictable and uncomfortable sickle cell pain crises can be. That's why it's so important to explore your options. One of those options is Adacvio. What exactly is Adacvio? Adacvio is a treatment for people 16 years or older with sickle cell disease that could reduce how often certain pain crises happen. It is not known if Adacvio is safe and effective in children under 16 years of age. And the Adacvio Warrior Way program can provide you with support, including tips, tools, and resources to help you understand Adacvio. Reducing the frequency of pain crises may be possible with Adacvio. Talk to your doctor to see if treatment with Adacvio is right for you and visit adacvio.com to learn more. That's A-D-A-K-V-E-O.com. Visit adacvio.com today. Important safety information. What is Adacvio? Adacvio is a prescription medicine used in people 16 years of age and older who have sickle cell disease to help reduce how often painful crises happen. It is not known if Adacvio is safe and effective in children under 16 years of age. What should I tell my doctor or healthcare provider before taking Adacvio? Before receiving Adacvio, tell your healthcare provider about all of your medical conditions, including if you are pregnant or plan to become pregnant. Adacvio may harm your unborn baby. Are breastfeeding or plan to breastfeed? It is not known if Adacvio passes into breast milk. You and your healthcare provider should decide the best way to feed your baby during treatment with Adacvio. Tell your healthcare provider about all of the medicines you take, including prescription and over-the-counter medicines, vitamins, and herbal supplements. How will I receive Adacvio? Your healthcare provider will give you Adacvio as an infusion into your vein through an intravenous or IV line over 30 minutes. You will receive your first infusion and then a second infusion two weeks later. After that, you will receive an infusion every four weeks. Your healthcare provider may also prescribe other treatments for you to take during treatment with Adacvio. Do not stop receiving Adacvio unless your healthcare provider tells you to. If you miss an appointment for an infusion, call your healthcare provider as soon as possible to reschedule. What are some of the possible side effects of Adacvio? Adacvio may cause serious side effects, including infusion-related reactions. Infusion-related reactions may happen during or within 24 hours of receiving an infusion of Adacvio. Your healthcare provider may slow down, temporarily stop, or completely stop your infusion with Adacvio if you are having an infusion-related reaction. You may continue to receive Adacvio at a slower infusion rate, and your healthcare provider may give you certain medicines before your infusion to lower your risk of getting an infusion-related reaction. Your healthcare provider should monitor you for signs and symptoms of infusion-related reactions and treat your symptoms as needed. Tell your healthcare provider right away if you get any of the following signs and symptoms of an infusion-related reaction. Pain in various locations, headache, fever, chills or shivering, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, tiredness, dizziness, sweating, hives, itching, shortness of breath, or wheezing. Adacvio may interfere with a blood test. Tell your healthcare provider if you are receiving Adacvio before having any blood test. Adacvio may interfere with a laboratory test to measure your platelet counts. The most common side effects of Adacvio include nausea, stomach area or abdominal pain or tenderness, joint pain, back pain, fever. 
These are not all of the possible side effects of Adacvio. For more information, ask your healthcare provider or pharmacist. Call your doctor for medical advice about side effects. You are encouraged to report negative side effects of prescription drugs to the Food and Drug Administration. Visit fda.gov slash medwatch or call 1-800-FDA-1088. General information about the safe and effective use of Adacvio. Medicines are sometimes prescribed for purposes other than those listed in a patient information leaflet. You can ask your healthcare provider or pharmacist for more information about Adacvio. No, so I want to I want to add like a layer of context to this very big picture. Now zooming out, if we're pulling on this thread a little bit more, and and warriors are curious, how many people do you think out of the seven billion people on this planet are thinking about this particular problem in sickle cell disease, gene therapy, curative gene th- curative uh, therapies, specifically gene therapy clonal hematopoiesis in the context of sickle cell disease. When you look around at your investigator colleagues, what would you assert? Are we talking dozens of people? Are we talking hundreds of people? The vast majority of people with sickle cell disease in the world are more worried about surviving, you know, their parents are more worried about surviving past the age of five than they are about having gene therapy or getting something to eat or getting penicillin or getting a vaccination. From a pure public health standpoint, worldwide, we would be much better off taking the money that we spend on gene therapy and using it to provide basic care in low-income countries like Africa, where sickle cell disease is most common. No question of that. I believe that you need both. You need to drive high technology advancements, and at the same time, you need to institute public health measures that can easily save lives. Because, you know, our hope those of us who do gene therapy is that you know you have to you have to start with something but eventually what we're aiming for is to be able to go to to low income countries and give people a shot that would that would prevent them from their sickle cell disease from from becoming bad but that you know that's a long way off i think but if you don't start somewhere you will never get there So I think you need both. The one thing I would add, just as we think about this whole issue, is it could be that the kind of gene therapy approaches or gene editing approaches that Mitch's group is attempting, that we at Boston Children's are attempting, that these might be quickly antiquated. Like there might be advances in the field that just quickly wash all of this and say, oh, that that was the old stuff, right? No question. Yeah. And and so I I think that that's... um, in my mind, the great opportunity for medicine to advance technologically, which is which is fantastic. But that may not get rid of the fact that patients with sickle cell disease have been reported to, at baseline, have a, about a threefold increased risk of getting one of these blood cancers over their life. Now, right now, we know, thanks to advances from Rust Ware and others, that even in Sub-Saharan Africa, using medications that we currently have available, like hydroxyurea, which has been, I know, discussed a lot on, on cheat codes, can actually help patients survive longer, can, can, can actually improve, you know, what, you know more, both, both reduce uh, complications and, and, and really help patients. And... Our hope is that as many of those therapies are applied, our current best therapies more globally than what we're doing right now, that we'll still need to address many of these questions. So, you know, I would argue in some ways that even if we don't think about even the gene therapy context or the cutting edge therapies, that these issues are going to be issues for all of our patients and they deserve to know and have answers and more data than what we have now. Um, you know, and I, I, you know, I mean, part of what we do in the lab is think about what underlies people's risk for getting other kinds of blood cancers. And I would argue that we know a lot about some kinds of risk factors. And yet there, you know, the, the incidence of sickle cell disease is so high. And yet here's a major risk factor that, you know, people in the cancer predisposition space have not even thought about. And, and so to me, it's such a important thing that we have to learn and we, we need to learn and we should learn. Both of your points are very well taken. 
I want to, I'm going to ask my question in just a little bit of a different way. How many Vijays and Mitch are out there that are working on curative therapy, specifically gene therapy and sickle cell disease? If you wanted to be in a room with all of your colleagues that are working on this problem, will you all fit in one room? Easily. I think there's probably 10, 20 people in this arena. Some but there's, yeah. there's more than there were several years ago. There's an excitement now. And I think part of the excitement is that for many years, there was nothing we could do about it. And there was no way to fix the genetics. And then what happened with this genome editing and CRISPR-Cas9 is, you know, it's like this tremendous tidal wave of technology. And there are way more than a room full of people working on that. Really smart scientists, you know, everywhere. It, mostly young scientists and, and, and brilliant. And they're producing all, these, all this technology at an unbelievable rate so that what you're doing becomes obsolete in a month. And what they're looking for is medical applications. They want to see their technology become useful. And, th and then you have these frustrated sickle cell doctors who for years hadn't been able to do much. And now there comes this opportunity and I feel like all we have to do is like stand there with a bucket and absorb some of that and, and engage these, these technology maestros with and combine our medical knowledge with, with, with what they're doing. And all of a sudden we have a, um, you know, we can divert that, that some of that tidal wave to help sickle cell patients. I think that's how, how a lot of us approach this. And, and the gene therapy, the gene editing guys and the gene therapy, you know, the Lenti viral vector guys, the, the technologists, they love it because it gives some, some purpose to, to what they're doing. So it's a good marriage or a good match. I, I think that that brings up something I was thinking about, which is, you know, watching from afar, you see changes in this field. I, I mean, almost daily, you go from gene addition to editing and editing with different tools and you know, CRISPR Cas9 looks amazing, but now people are using different Cas's with it, and they have high fidelity versions, and they're using different uh, regimens to get stem cells and quality control. And you have all of these, you know, really amazing advances and different parts moving. How do we study all of these things in the context of this, you know, moving train and really competing interests too? So how how do you get you know a, a, a sort of data set where you can monitor safety and monitor efficacy across platforms across time that are constantly changing. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll flip it around a little bit, Mike, which is that there are thousands of sickle cell patients. There have been, you know, dozens of patients in, in gene therapy trials or editing trials. And I think we just have to bear in mind that for all of our sickle cell warriors, we need to better understand, even at a baseline, what's happening, what, what are the risks. And, and so I think that there's even a lot to learn outside of the context of these emerging therapies that we really have a responsibility to do. I mean, you know, it's to me rather sad that the best natural history study that we have in the U.S., it was essentially a study that was conducted in the 1980s, you know, and that's where a lot of our data is, this cooperative study of sickle cell disease. And there has not been, sadly, much since then. And, and I think that, you know, if, if I was a politician, which I'm not, but if I was a politician, I would be saying, well, where is the funding for natural history studies. Why don't we all get together? Why is, you know, it shouldn't just be because because even institutions like St. Jude's or Boston Children's, we don't have enough patients to learn the data on our own or, you know, who um, in Detroit, and, you know, anywhere. We just don't. But we, if we could all come together, I think we could learn a lot more. And we really should because that's really ultimately what our warriors deserve and, and need. And so I think we all have to work together to, to learn that. Now, Vijay, I, I would like to say that we have a pretty good natural history study at St. Jude. And one of the reasons that we have it is because St. Jude is willing to fund it. Uh, it is hard to get federal funding for, for such studies. And we have realized that we just don't have enough patients by ourselves to, to, to get all the information we need. 
so we're we're working you know we're trying to work with consortia like topmed to to expand and to contribute our data to bigger efforts but that that's definitely the way that things need to go and, and i think you know the the other aspect of it which i think is is really important to to answer your question mike is i think that we the technology will always be changing but i think it's important that people who sort of live in these worlds you know, Mitch and I are both aware of the latest and greatest tools, and we talk to a lot of people who are developing these tools. But we also live and practice as, as pediatric hematologists. And I think we have to wear both of those hats in what we do in thinking about it. Because, you know, a lot of people, a lot of these young people that Mitch was talking about who develop these tools, they have no idea what a blood forming stem cell is. They have no idea how to transplant that blood forming stem cell or what the limitations are. They have a lot of ideas, which is great, but also one has to remember that there are boundary constraints. And I think one of the values of having, you know, the, the dozen or so of us who are, you know, well-trained in kind of both areas is that you can straddle those spheres and realize that there are limitations to the existing approaches. And even if it's really an attractive approach, you know, that, that it gets a lot of buzz in the media, which a lot of these tools will, but sometimes that's hard to really implement to yeah. develop a cure. And, and, and that's something, you know, that I think you just have to bear in mind that advances happen, that they're sometimes challenging to happen. But, you know, the way I always think about it is one of my mentors, David Nathan, you know, when he was a resident, he told this crazy plastic surgeon that he would not care for his patient who that plastic surgeon wanted to do a transplant on. Well, he, the, the surgeon kind of said, you know what, I'll go and take care of the patient on my own ward myself. And the next time Dave and Nathan saw that patient was on the cover of Life magazine, because that patient was the first successful recipient of a kidney transplant. And the surgeon was Joe Murray. And so, you know, that's been a lesson for me is that advances in medicine sometimes just take people sticking to the, the problems that they want to take. And, and, you know, obviously kidney transplantation has had a huge impact on, and organ transplantation in general has had a huge impact on medicine. And in a similar vein, I think that we will see you know, stops and starts to what we do. But if we stick to it, if we stick to the science and we keep pushing ourselves to do better, I think we will do better. Persistence. It's all about persistence and filters. You know, you, you don't want to be so excited about a technology that it, you apply it prematurely. And I think that investigational review boards, ethics boards, in general, work pretty well to protect patients. You know, that you need that. And the other thing you need is I mean, I'm a lab guy, and I would say that you're mostly a lab guy too, VJ. You need those hardcore clinicians, actually, like like the two of you. Would you call yourselves hardcore cl clinicians, Mike and Amal? Uh, <laughs> I'll take that. I take it as a compliment. You need them to, to em implement the clinical trials. So it really is, you know, you, it's multidisciplinary, and if you try to go at it on your own, it, it's dangerous. And that's why we respect each other, even if we're competing. There's just so, I, I feel like I could talk to you guys all week. Me too. <laughs> you know, top of mind for me always is, you know, no progress is made without patience, right? If the patients are not aligned with what your goals are as scientists, progress is going to be very difficult to make. So I, I wonder about the efforts that exist in including or bringing patients in and, and making this meeting patients where they're where they are to make the concept of gene therapy and gene editing a little bit more tangible. I'd love to hear about efforts that you guys may be involved in locally, nationally, internationally, that that really work to allow patients to touch this process a little bit. I can tell you, we just we just submitted a grant application. To, to help fund some of the work we're doing on, on gene therapy. And w one of our aims w was to put together appropriate education packages so, in order to deliver the most informed consent possible in the most ethical way possible 
and the, and 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 so part of that involved um, putting together focus groups that included you know medical professionals and patients, and working with the local sickle cell organization um, to to develop educational content. And we would never th and and we have a, a person at our hospital who's who's focused on doing that, a person who's a, a, a bioethicist. We would never dare to submit that grant application without without having that aim because, um, you know, I think that I, people are reviewers and funding agencies and physicians are, are very keenly aware of that. And I, I'll tell you one other thing, and then, then I, I won't, I won't say anything more because there's only a few minutes left, but when this, um, when, when, when the information about this, you know, the, these blood cancers in the gene therapy patients came up, I called one of my friends who was, who was, leading leading a trial at one of the hospitals and i said to her how, you know how's it going what's going on and she she said i've been on the phone for the last two days with my patients try, you know trying to explain what's going on and i've even you know i've talked to several patients who are about to have this and it's taken up my life in, in, for, for the last few days and, and and i could sense the close relationship that she had with her patients and there was there was trust and, and, you know, what she told me is that the, for the most part, the patients weren't angry because she had taken the time to, um, to, to, to develop that, that kind of relationship and that kind of informed consent with them. And then I called another person at a different place and he told me the same thing. So, you know, people are very well aware of this. And, I, and what I've seen, how do I say, impresses me. I hope, too, in some small way, you guys coming on Cheat Codes is doing this, you know, getting the word out about the science in a digestible way to patients. So really appreciate it. You guys are scientists and you're very data driven. But I'm going to I'm going to ask you in the next couple minutes to not be data driven. I want to ask you guys, I'm going to implore you to be dreamers for the next five minutes. And let's start with Vijay. Vijay, putting taking off that data hat and putting on your inspirational hat. Where are we in sickle cell therapeutics 10 years from now? I hope in 10 years, I hope that getting a transplant, getting you know the blood stem cells replaced can be done as an outpatient procedure. You could come in, like you get blood transfused, get, you know, get treated either at home or, or in, in the hospital. You know, we get rid of the bad blood forming stem cells and we replace them. And I think that that's going to require a lot of advances, but I think there's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of research happening in sickle cell disease. There's a lot of research that's also happening in trying to better understand and harness blood forming stem cells. And I think that all of that is very important to allow this. And as, as Mitch described, there's, it's also just as important that we continue to push research in the clinical arena and learn, both learn from what's happening in our patients, but also try to develop better therapies for our patients. And I think each step is incremental. You know, you would not have a kidney transplant have occurred if it were not for the development of, you know, basic understandings of tolerance and, and a lot of other issues and a lot of developments of, of kind of surgical techniques that required, you know, decades of work. And I think we're in a similar spot in hematology. You know, one thing we didn't talk about is allogeneic trans bone marrow transplants, transplants from other people. And and that field could be advanced to the point where it's as good as gene therapy. VJ alluded to it. But my my dream in, in ten years is is to have a therapy to to correct the defective gene that can be given in the vein and that can go to the bo patient's bone marrow and, and correct those th those blood forming cells like we do for hemophilia now, actually, without the, any of the toxicity that, that we have now. That's dream one. And dream two is there are so, even if we had that, to get that to the millions of patients that there are would be di very difficult. I would, I would also hope that there is a pill that works 50 times better than hydroxyurea to prevent all of the organ damage and complications that have in sickle cell disease that, we, that, that doesn't cost a lot of money that we could go to low-income countries and just distribute that, and that we have a, a world where, there is, where, where the, the disparities in delivery of health care are completely erased so that we can do that effectively. The best vision that I've seen for that is on Star Trek. 
So if you watch Star Trek or you go online, I think they had it right. You know, there was no patient that had to pay for medical care. And, you know, they had the, I forget what they were called, you know, the phasalizers that, that, that could treat anything. But everybody was treated the same. I think eliminating disparities in healthcare is equally important, if not more, than the technologies. But to have them both together would be the dream, the dream life. Well, with that, with that, I mean, I, I want to just thank you both for pulling along with this Star Trek theme. Thank you both for your contributions that are going to allow sickle cell patients to live long and prosper. We are indebted to you as um, colleagues. We're indebted to you um, for, for all the hard work that you put into this and for your time that you've spent with us and the Warriors today. We love what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having us. And you guys are welcome to use Cheat Codes as a platform anytime you want. Thank you so much once again. Sickle Cell Warriors, if you want to, uh, one last thing before we leave, because what's going to happen is Sickle Cell Warriors are going to say, how do we keep up with what's happening in the Sankaran lab and the Weiss lab? Where can they keep up with what you guys are doing? How do they follow you? Yeah, if, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I've, I've, I've sometimes been a little bit quieter, but um, I am um, blood genes um, as one word. Um, so, so please do follow me and, and I try to keep things updated both about our work, but also work in the field more broadly. And, and so definitely um, please do follow. I'm more electronically challenged than VJ. Um, so I don't do social media very much, but, and it makes me want to update my website at St. Jude, but, but, but you can email me. And if you go to St. Jude website, it'll give my email address and I'm happy to talk about it with anybody who is interested. Beautiful. There you have it, Warriors. I want to thank the patients again. Please. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing no, nothing for patients without patients. We thank you guys. Um, please go ahead and uh, follow both of these exceptional individuals who are just driving this deal forward. Thank you, guys. Thanks again. Thank you.